Emerson. I work for the Illinois Student Assistance Commission. Um, I am the Eastern Illinois Region Coordinator and I am here to talk to you tonight about financial aid. Um, this is a very comprehensive presentation. It goes over the entire financial aid process a whole, as a whole from beginning to end. Um, feel free to stop me uh, with questions throughout or you're welcome to uh, ask me questions at the end after it's over or you're welcome to contact me with any questions. So um, hopefully I'm able to um, answer some questions that you have about the financial aid process and um, yeah we'll go ahead and get started. This is just a little bit about me. So I graduated from Illinois State in 2020. Um, I'm actually currently pursuing my master's degree um, for college student affairs at, um, at Eastern Illinois University. Um, I'm actually in my final semester of that, so I'm very excited for that. Um, I'm here to help you with the college, um, college going and financial aid processes. Um, typically, there would be an ISAC rep within the DACC district. Um, unfortunately, there isn't one now, um, but me being the region coordinator, I'm going to do my best to make myself available for you guys throughout the year um, if you need assistance with this stuff. Um, again, I work for an organization called ISAC, um, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about a little bit more about what we do. Um, so, ISAC is the College Access and Financial Aid Agency in Illinois. Um, so, basically, we're the ones that administer state financial aid. Um, we administer all different types of financial aid programs. So, we have grants, scholarships, prepaid tuition programs, loan forgiveness programs, um, all types of good stuff um, to help students throughout Illinois. Our mission is to provide um, Illinois students with information and assistance to help make education beyond high school accessible and affordable. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but I think it's really important. Um, this is kind of the drive behind the work that we do, um, and I really enjoy it. So. Um, like I said, you guys are probably going to have a ton of questions. Probably, be, probably the biggest ones being how much um, is college going to cost and am I going to be able to pay for it? Um, so hopefully I'm able to um, release some stress with this presentation, provide you guys with some good information. Um, you, may, you may also be thinking what exactly is financial aid? How do I apply? Um, things like that. So I'm going to be covering all of this throughout the presentation, but again, feel free to ask questions if you need um, further clarification on something. So there are many things that um, are uh, umbrellaed under post-secondary education. So when most people think of post-secondary education, they think of going off to a four-year university. Yes, that is one form of college, but there's many different types of colleges out there as well. Um, there's community colleges, there's trade and vocational schools, there's public and private institutions. So there's all different types of colleges and post-secondary education out there. Um, and then these are the different um, timelines for whatever path you may want to pursue. So a vocational or a trade program takes around two years, as well as an associate's degree at a community college. A bachelor's degree will take around four years. And then if you want to pursue grad school after receiving your bachelor's degree, it takes around one to three years um, to receive a master's or a professional degree after, um, after receiving your bachelor's. Um, so for me personally, the program that I chose is three and a half years. Um, I highly encourage you not to do that. If you do decide to uh, pursue grad school, pick like a two-year program. That's typically how much they are, but I chose the longest one possible. I'm not sure why, but um, it's been worth it. Um, so what exactly is financial aid? Um, it's money that can be borrowed, given, or earned um, to help you pay for college. Um, there's all different types of financial aid out there. Um, it's meant to bridge the gap between what you can afford to pay and what college costs. So let's say the cost of a college is up here and you can only afford this much. This is where financial aid comes in. Kinds of, it can, it's a, a means of bridging that gap. Um, it can come from all different sources too, which I'm going to cover as well. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, what financial aid is. Um, there are many things that you're going to be paying for as a college student. So there are def many different costs that you're going to be paying for while you're in college. So we have tuition and fees. We have living expenses. We have food expenses. We have transportation, books, course materials, supplies, um, miscellaneous expenses. All of these things are covered under the cost of college. You can see on the right here that they can be um, either direct or indirect. So a direct fee is what you're paying directly to the institution. So um, tuition and fees, that's a direct cost because you're paying the school to be a student there. Um, but like living expenses can be direct or indirect. 
So if you're living on campus somewhere as a first year freshman, then you're paying the school to live there, so that's a direct cost. But then, you know, junior, senior year, when you move off campus to an apartment, you know, you're not paying the school to live there anymore. Um, so this is important to keep in mind. Um, you have to think about where your money's going to um, because you're going to be paying a, for a lot while you're in school. And it's very expensive. We all know that. Um, and that's why I'm stressing the importance of financial aid here. So there's two different types of financial aid. We have gift aid and self-help aid. So gift aid comes in the form of grants and scholarships. Grants are usually need-based and are awarded based on financial need or limited financial ability to pay for college. So that's where grants come in. And then we have scholarships. So scholarships are usually awarded based on merit. So academic achievement, athletic achievement, artistic ability, things like that. Uh, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of scholarships out there. You can get scholarships for anything. You can get scholarships for, for being left-handed, for having green eyes, for being above six foot. Like these are just a few different examples of you know, scholarships that you can receive. Um, so you should be applying for to as many scholarships as you possibly can um, and maximize the amount of money that you can get for school. There's also self-help aid. Now with self-help aid, there's a little bit more responsibility involved. So with self-help aid, we have loans and work study. With loans, those have to be paid back. We all know about the scary, scary student loans. We're all aware of that. Um, I'm paying mine off still. I'm sure many parents in here are still paying off their loans. So not fun, not a good time. And then there's also work study. So work study is a program in which you're going to be working either on or off campus, and you're, you're going to be receiving money um, that will go towards your schooling. Um, so if you're interested in a work study program, um, I would suggest researching the schools that you want to go to and find out first off if they have work study, because it's a campus-based program, so it's going to vary from school to school if they have work study or not. And then also how much money you can receive because that's going to vary from school to school as well. Um, I, I highly encourage taking the work study route if you're going to be going out to university especially because um, it can help cut down on some of the, um, you know, cut down on that cost a little bit. So like I said, financial aid can come from a variety of different places. It can come from the federal government, which would be the U.S. Department of Education. It could be the state government, which is us, ISAC, we're the ones that administer state financial aid. It can come from colleges and the universities and in the form of institutional aid. This is where a big chunk of your financial aid is going to come from as well. And then there's also private sources as well. So this could be a bank, this could be a private loan servicer. Um, there's all different types of private loan sources out there as well. So when you fill out your FAFSA, which I'm going to talk about more, there's a good chance that you're going to be receiving aid from these three sources, the federal government, the state government, and from colleges. After you receive financial aid from those sources and then you think, wow, this school that I want to go to, I still can't afford it, that's when you can think about maybe turning to those private sources of aid. So like a bank loan or Sally May or a college app. That's just a couple different examples, but there's a ton out there. Um, but I highly encourage you to maximize the amount that you get um, from filling out the FAFSA um, because with private loan sources, um, like with loans, for instance, there can be crazy interest rates and it can be insanely expensive to go the private, the private aid route. So try to avoid it if you can, but sometimes you can't and that's totally okay. Um, you just have to do your research and figure out what's best for you and what you can afford. Um, just a few extra tips with looking for some other sources of aid. Um, when looking for scholarships, think about what you buy, what you eat, what you wear. You know, Coca-Cola, uh, Starbucks, um, all these um, big, big um, national companies, they're going to have, um, you know, scholarships available um, that you can receive. Um, and then you also want to look at the local level as well. So a lot of the time local scholarships have a lot less competition which means a smaller, smaller applicant pool, which means that you, know, you may only be one of few that apply for a certain scholarship or you may be the only one applying for a scholarship and you're guaranteed to get it. Um, this happens a lot. A lot of the time scholarships go to waste because people don't apply for them, which is very unfortunate. Um, so it's really important to kind of do as much research as you can to kind of you know, figure out um, you know, how to maximize those scholarships. 
And then of course, as always, look out for scholarship scams. Um, you shouldn't be paying any money to fill out any scholarship applications. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you pay money to get money? Um, same goes with the FAFSA and ISAC's alternative app. Um, all of these things are completely free. You should not be paying any money um, to have somebody fill out the FAFSA for you or to help you fill out the FAFSA. Um, you know, that's what ISAC is for. We're here to help you out. So um, here are a couple examples of some federal gift aid programs. So this is that free money that doesn't need to be paid back. Um, we have the Pell Grant. Um, this is a need-based grant. You can receive up to se over $7,000 um, um, from this grant. And the only thing that you have to do to um, you know, receive this grant is to fill out the FAFSA. If you're eligible for it, you will receive it. It may not be the full amount. It may only be some, but either way, it's that free money. Next, we have the FSCOG. Um, this is not a very common grant. Um, this is if a school receives some extra funding to give to students, then you know, they, they will give this out. Um, so that's what this is for. Um, it's a campus-based uh, grant, so it kind of varies from school to school, you know, if they'll have it, if they'll be able to give it out, and the amount that they'll be able to give out. Um, but it's something to look out for on your financial aid offers. Next, we have some federal um, self-help aid programs. So again, this is the ones with a little bit more work. So I talked about um, federal work study already. We also have federal subsidized and unsubsidized loans. And then we have a parent plus loan. So with the federal subsidized loans, these are need-based. And it's subsidized, which means that the interest is paid for while the student is in school at least half time during grace periods and during deferment. <laughs> So let's say you take out a $3,500 um, federal direct loan and it's subsidized. Um, while you're in school, the interest will be paid for. Um, now, once you graduate, that's when the interest is going to start to begin to accrue. Um, but um, you want to uh, receive as much subsidized money as possible to kind of save on that interest because the interest is kind of, it will, it will really add up and it makes the loans very expensive. And then we have the unsubsidized loan. So this is not a need-based loan. And with unsubsidized loans, you, you are responsible for, pay, for paying that interest. So you can either pay it while you're in school or after you graduate, but you're going to be responsible for paying it back. So um, just to recap, maximize as much subsidized money as you possibly can. And then we have the Parent PLUS loan. So this is a credit-based loan, so it's going to be based on your credit score. Um, and the parent or graduate student, it's also available to graduate students as well. Um, the parent is going to be responsible for paying this loan back. So this is a loan that the parent takes out on the student's behalf, and then they're going to be responsible for paying it back. Um, so if you see anything about a Parent PLUS loan and your financial aid offers, just know that you, know, you as a parent, you're going to be the one that's paying it. So to talk a little bit more about loans, um, you're going to want to evaluate your loan options as best as you can. There's a few ways that you can do that. First off, you're going to want to think about the source of the loan. Um, you want to know where it's coming from, who you're giving your money to, um, if it's a federal loan or if it's a private loan. Um, any loan that you receive from filling out the FAFSA, you know, your direct loans, those are federal loans. But then your private loans are going to be, like I said, from Sally May or College Ave, um, a bank. Um, those are going to be your private loan sources. Um, you're going to want to think about your interest rate. Is it variable or is it fixed? Um, if it's fixed, it just means that um, the interest rate is going to stay the same throughout the duration of the loan. But with variable interest rates, they can change. They can go up or down. So it's something, something to keep in mind as well. And then also the repayment option and grace period. Um, so how am I going to pay back these loans? And what is my period after I graduate in which I don't have to pay these loans back? So that's something to keep in mind as well. Next, we have some Illinois gift aid programs. So these are going to be coming at the, from the state level from MISAC. Um, so we have the MAP grant. This is a need-based loan. You can get up to $8,400 um, for tuition and fees. Um, again, you are, if you are eligible for this loan, you fill out the FAFSA, you're going to get it. It's really that simple. Um, and um, it's that free money that doesn't need to be paid back. We also have the Illinois Veterans Grant, Illinois National Guard Grant, and Grants for Dependents of Police, Fire, and Correctional Officers. Um, I'm not going to go too in-depth with these um, because I have a lot of content to get through. But if you have any questions about these or you think one of these may apply to you, just let me know and we can talk about it. Um, they all cover tuition and fees, too. Next, we have some gift aid teaching programs. 
Um, so we have the TEACH grant. The TEACH grant is actually at the federal level. So this is a federal um, scholarship program. You can receive up to $3,772. Uh, $3, um, now I know we're calling these gift aid, but there's a little bit, a, a little bit of a stipulation with that. Um, there's a teaching requirement. And if that teaching requirement isn't fulfilled, it turns into a loan that you have to pay back. So I know technically I'm calling it gift aid, but there's still a, bit, a little bit more responsibility. Um, so if you know teaching is something that you're interested in, I encourage you to look into these. Um, they're gonna be very beneficial for you. We also have the Minority Teachers of Illinois Scholarship, Special Education Teacher Tuition Waiver, and ECACE, um, which is a mouthful at the bottom there, but this is for uh, anyone interested in early uh, childhood education. That's something that they can look into as well. Um, again, all three of these uh, have a teaching requirement as well. Um, so I encourage you to look into them, um, but just know that that teaching requirement is there. And um, if you don't fulfill it, it's gonna turn into a loan. So, like I've been saying, you fill out the FAFSA. These are the two big grants that you can get right here, the MAP grant and the Pell grant. So in total, just for filling out the FAFSA, you could potentially get up to 16 grand that can go towards your schooling. That is a big chunk of change. You know, that can completely pay for a room and board and then some, it's a ton of money. Um, but first, you gotta get the FAFSA done. And two, you gotta be eligible for them. So it's gonna depend on your financial situation. Um, you may not receive the full amount for these, but you may get some, and hey, it's free money. You know, It's the good stuff. Um, another reason why I'm gonna stress filling out the FAFSA 10,000 times during this presentation is because um, you know there, there's limited availability on these grants sometimes. So for instance, the MAP grant is an appropriation. So basically what that means is there's a set amount of funds set aside for this grant and then once it runs out, it runs out. And then you get put on a wait list and then you don't know if you're gonna get the MAP grant or not. Um, it definitely happens. It happened this past school year. Um, you know, if for people who are still filling out the 2024-25 FAFSA, um, if they filling out that FAFSA, then they're gonna be, uh, get put on the wait list for MAP. Um, so it's really, really important um, to get the application done as soon as it opens. It's gonna be opening on December 1st this year. So you got a little bit of time, um, but once it opens, get it done as soon as you possibly can. So this is the financial aid process as a whole. It's a bit of a cycle. Um, the first step is completing your application. The next is completing the verification process, um, and then receiving and re reviewing your financial aid um, offers from the colleges that you list. And you're gonna make a decision um, on which school that you wanna go to, and then you're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna go there, and then you're gonna tell the other schools, hey, I'm not gonna be a student at your school. You're gonna complete any pending processes, whatever those may be. It could be a lot of things. It could be um, your housing deposit, um, picking a meal plan, getting your immunizations, all of that fun stuff. Um, that's a very exciting part of the year because you know, you're almost on your way to being a college student. It's really, really exciting. And then make sure you're repeating this every year. Um, filling out the FAFSA is not a one-time deal. Um, you have to do it every single year that you're gonna be in school. So like I said, step one is completing your application. So you're either gonna be, gonna be doing the FAFSA or the alternative application for Illinois financial aid. So one or the other, you're not gonna be doing both. Uh, most of you are likely going to be filling out the FAFSA, which is a free application for federal student aid. Um, you can get this done at FAFSA.gov. Um, I encourage you to take a look at this website, um, get familiar with it because you're gonna be on it probably quite a bit come December when you're having problems filling out the application. So um, I would say get used to it. Um, and then uh, the alternative app is for qualifying undocumented students who can't fill out the FAFSA. So that's what that's there for. Um, schools may require other forms as well. So um, for instance, the CSS profile is a big one. Um, not very many schools require this, but some schools do. Um, so I would do um, some research on what is considered a complete financial aid application um, to the school that you wanna go to because it might not just be the FAFSA or the alternative app. There might be some other forms that you have to get done as well. Um, so you gotta get all that stuff turned in. So, so make sure you're gathering the, all of the information that you need to fill out the application. I actually have a handout, um, the yellow one over there. I actually have a ton of handouts over there, so please take them on your way out. But this yellow one right here um, details this. So it has all the information that you're gonna need, um, all of the forms, all the documentation that you're gonna need to fill out the FAFSA. 
So you're gonna need your federal tax returns, W-2s and records of income. So it's gonna be your 2023 tax return because the form asks for prior, prior tax information. So you guys are gonna be filling out the 2025, 26 application. So it's gonna be your 2023 tax returns. It's also gonna be your banking savings records of investments, um, records of untaxed income, and a list of colleges that you would like to attend. Um, because like I've said, you're gonna be listing schools on the application. You can list up to 20 schools. I would not suggest applying to 20 schools. That's a little bit crazy. I would try to condense that to maybe six to 10 at the most. Um, feel free to apply to that many as you want, um, but um, you can list up to 20 schools. So I would you know, kind of uh, compile that list beforehand so you can just boop, 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 plug them in and be done with it. Um, just as an aside, uh, ask Mrs. Leverens or uh, somebody about um, college application waivers, fee waivers. Um, that's going to save you a ton of money. You know, sometimes college application fees can be like 50 to 75 bucks. Pretty ridiculous. And when you're applying to five to 10 schools, it can really add up. So ask about those fee waivers for sure. Um, and then just for the FAFSA only, you're going to need your social security number. You're going to need your alien registration number um, for the students that um, do not have a social security number. And then you're also going to need your federal student aid ID or FSA ID. Um, parents and um, students are both going to need this FSA ID, which is essentially your studentaid.gov account. So this is how you access and complete the application. So that's what you're going to need. Uh, just as an aside, neither application asks about parent immigration status. So, um, so like I've said, uh, to access and complete uh, the FAFSA, you're going to need your FSA ID, which is basically your, you know, your username and password to access the application. Um, students and parents both need one, so they need to both do this process. Um, students, make sure you're using your personal email address. Don't use your school email because you're going to lose access to that once you graduate, um, and then that's going to you know, kind of be a trouble for when you're trying to fill out the FAFSA. So make sure you're using a Gmail or something like that. It's best to get your FSA ID, done, FSA ID done before you start the FAFSA. You can start this process now. I encourage you to get your FSA ID done ASAP as soon as you can um, because it needs to go through a verification process through the Social Security Administration, which takes a few days to a week. Um, so just make sure you're getting this done now so that you know when it's time to fill it out December 1st, you already have it done and you don't have to worry about it. Like I said, this can be done at studentaid.gov or fafsa.gov. It kind of takes you to the same place. So that's where you're going to be able to fill that out. Um, parents without a social security number can create an FSA ID. Um, so just as an aside, um, there is an option for students without a social, or parents without a social security number to create that FSA ID. Um, if you think that this applies to you, and then when you go to fill it out, you have questions about how this um, works, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I have my business cards over here, and then I also have my contact information at the end of the presentation. So, so if you are a dependent student for purposes of the FAFSA, you're gonna need some parent information. So most students report parental information until the age of 24, um, because up until that age, you are a dependent student. Um, even, if parents, even if the student doesn't live with the parent, they're still going to need their parental information. Okay? So for financial uh, purposes, these are the only three people who can, um, only three people who can put their um, information on their student's application. So we have biological parents, adoptive parents, and step parents if married to a biological parent. So that means that legal guardians, aunt, uncle, grandma, grandpa, brother, sister, these people should not be putting their information on the FAFSA. Um, so like I said, if you have questions about this, please let me know. Um, but these are the only people who should be putting their information um, on the application. Yes, how can I help you? So I'm his legal guardian? Yes. Aunt, court, court ordered legal guardian? then he is an independent student. He does not need to put parent information on the form. So he don't even put any of those because there's no way I can get a hold of his mom's information. Right, right. If you are a court order legal guardian, then he is an independent student, which makes it easier for you because you just have to do your part and boom, send it in like that. So um, let's work for you guys. So. I didn't have to put mine on there. But. Right, right, exactly. So, so it's going to be a very easy process for you guys. So. 
So this is a little flow chart. It doesn't really look like a flow chart, but I promise it goes up the <laughs> top to bottom. Um, which parents should be reporting their information? So are the students um, biological or adoptive parents married to each other? Yes, both of their, then that means that both parents' information needs to go on the form. If they're unmarried, do they live together? If yes, then both, of the, uh, both parents' information goes on the form. And then if one parent provided most of the financial support for that student within the past 12 months, then that's, then that's the parent that's going to be adding their information on the form. And if for some reason, if it's you know completely 50-50, like both mom and dad receive, um, you know, provide equal financial support for the student, this isn't you know very common, but it does happen. Then just the uh, the parent that makes the most money is going to be the one that reports their information. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. Um, but usually, um, you know, mom and dad are usually able to decide you know who's who's putting their information on the form. So that's kind of what that looks like. These are the sections of the FAFSA. Um, we have the student section and the parent section. Um, so before, in past years, one person was able to log in and kind of fill out the entire application on their own. Um, that is not the case anymore. Um, so the student has to fill out the student section and the parent has to fill out the parent section. So what that looks like is the student will do their part and then they will actually put in their parents' information and then the parent will get an email link that takes them to their form and then they will do their section. Um, so this kind, kind, this kind of encourages it to be more you know, collaborative. Um, it allows um, everybody to do their part individually. Um, so that's kind of what that's going to look like now. And then these are the different sections, all the different piece, pieces that you're going to be filling out. Um, the form's a lot easier now. Um, I, there were a lot of troubles with it last year, but overall, the form itself is definitely a lot simpler and a lot easier than it used to be. Um, the, question, the amount of questions got cut like in half. Um, so it definitely is a lot more simple. Um, I'm just praying that there's not as much issues as there were last year, because it was kind of disastrous. So, <laughs> so hopefully they cleaned it up this year. And then these are the sections of the alternative app. So it's, it mirrors the FAFSA. So once you get it done, you're going to have to provide an electronic signature on your FAFSA. And you do that with your, with your FSA ID. Um, so at the end of the application, it's going to say, um, you know, you click a checkbox, you say, I verify that all the information that I put on this form is accurate, complete, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then it's going to provide that electronic, electronic signature. Um, so students and parents are both going to have to do this for their own sections. Um, and then with the alternative app, it's a little bit of a different process. You get a, you get a PIN number sent to you by ISAC, and then you use that to fill out the form. Um, so it's a bit different. So when you uh, complete your FAFSA, it's going to generate a number called the Student Aid Index. Um, basically, uh, what this is, is it reflects the amount that you and your family can contribute towards your education. It can be a negative number. It's actually a good thing if it's a negative number. So you're going to see this on your confirmation, confirmation page after you fill out the FAFSA. And then you're also going to see it on the financial aid offers that you receive from the schools. Um, but if, the student, if your student aid index is negative, it can go down to negative, 50, negative 1,500. It's actually a good thing. It means that you're you know, potentially going to receive more money towards your schooling. Um, so if you see the negative, it's good. Um, this SAI is essentially used to determine your eligibility for federal, state, and institutional aid programs. So colleges will use this number to kind of figure out how much financial aid they need to give you. And I'm going to kind of show you what that looks like um, later on. When you fill out the FAFSA, you may get selected for verification. And this is a very common process. This happens to a lot of people. Um, I personally was never selected, but I'm sure there's you know, parents in here who probably, you know, probably did get selected for verification. Um, if this happens, don't freak out. Don't uh, be alarmed. It's not a big deal. This is just a process that schools use to determine if the information that you put on the form is accurate. 
So um, you'll be informed if you got selective verification either by email or they'll tell you in your student portal. And then they're probably just gonna ask for some documentation. So it may be you know, some additional tax information, a list of members in the household. Um, they'll ask for many different things. Um, you're just going to want to make sure to get those forms turned in on time because essentially when you're selected for verification, you know, your financial aid is going to be put on hold until you get through that process. So um, it's not a big deal. It happens all the time. People get selected randomly. Um, people get selected when they enter something incorrectly on the form. Um, but you just got to make sure to send them whatever they want you know, as soon as possible um, so that you can get that financial aid as soon as you can. So um, this is how schools um, send you financial aid offers and determine your financial need. So this is a little, little formula that they use. So they take the cost of attendance of their school, they subtract your SAI, which is that number that gets generated when you fill out the FAFSA, and then this equals your financial need. So your financial need is what you owe a school before you receive financial aid whether that be grants, scholarships, what have you. Um, so they kind of use um, your financial need and then they'll send you a financial aid offer based on that. Um, so you're gonna be receiving, so depending on how many schools that you um, listed on the FAFSA, uh, you're gonna be receiving anywhere from one to 20 of these offers, like I said. It all depends how many schools that you list. Um, you're going to want to take a look at each of these financial aid offers and kind of make a decision on what school is best for you financially based off of these offers. Now I will say um, these financial aid offers can be confusing to look at. Um, they have a lot of confusing jargon. The way that they display the financial aid offer, uh, their financial aid offer to you can be really confusing. They never look the same from school to school. Um, this can be a pretty stressful part of the financial aid process, um, especially if you're getting a ton of them from a bunch of different schools. Um, so um, just a little plug in, ISAC has a very a cool tool called the financial aid comparison worksheet. It's available on the student portal. I have a handout for that as well to kind of access that. Um, but this is a cool little tool that you can use to figure out, um, to kind of look at your financial aid offers, compare and contrast them, and figure out which school is the best for, for you financially. Um, there's a lot of things that you're going to want to look at on these financial aid offers. Um, what's, the different, what's the different types of financial aid that they're giving me? Are they giving me grants and scholarships or is it just loans? Um, what's my final out-of-pocket cost that I owe a school? Um, after I've received all of my financial aid, you know, what's that final amount that I owe? Am I going to be able to afford that? Um, which ones are renewable? Um, is this a one-time scholarship? Is this a one-time loan? Or am I, or am I gonna get it every single year that I'm gonna be in school there? Um, so these are all the different things that you're gonna wanna think about when you're looking at your financial aid offers. So this is an example of a few hypothetical scenarios of different schools. You can see that the cost of attendance varies greatly, um, anywhere from thirteen dollars to $40,000. Um, yes, schools are $40,000 a year. It's insane. Um, and then this is the, the formula that they use to kind of figure out um, your remaining need and how they're going to be able to package you financial aid. This is confusing. Um, you don't really need to know this formula. Um, it's good for you to know, but you're, not, you're probably not gonna remember this at the end of the presentation. But the point that I wanna hammer with this slide right here is that the initial sticker price of a school, you know, that price that they're advertising, um, you don't wanna be worried and concerned about that as much. What you want to be most concerned with is the amount that you owe a school um, after your SAI is deducted, after you've received all of your financial aid from the school, you know, what is that final out-of-pocket cost that I owe, or that net price? Um, that number is gonna be a lot more accurate um, and kind of determining if a school is the right um, decision for you financially. Um, so I know this number right here can be very scary, um, you know, for, uh, you know, for $40,000 a year, like that's, that's just mind boggling to look at. Um, but you know, typically schools that 
have a higher cost like this are able to give out a lot more financial aid. So a school that looked really expensive in the beginning, after you fill out the FAFSA, you may, may think, wow, I'm actually able to go to this school. I can actually afford it because they gave me a ton of financial aid. Um, so don't freak, about, freak out about costs. Um, just make sure you get your financial aid application done. And then that'll, you'll, that'll be better in helping you figure out which school is the best for you. And then um, it's, it's decision time. It's going to be time to figure out which school that you want to go to. Um, accept the offer from the school that you want to go to. Just let them know, hey, uh, I'm, I want to be a student at your school. And then you can also just inform the other schools that you applied to. Just say, hey, I'm not going to be a student there. Um, thank you for the offer. Thank you for the interest. And then they can give you know, that spot to somebody else. So. And like I said, these are all the different things that you're going to be doing, you know, in that pending processing stage. Um, I kind of went over all of these, so um, just make sure you're getting all this stuff done promptly um, before, you know, moving day. Every year, every year, this has to be done. Um, you know, your financial aid situation is going to change from year to year, so that's why it's not a one-time deal. Um, it could be loss of income, new family member, marriage, divorce, all of these things can change um, year to year. So you have to make sure you're getting that FAFSA done every single year. Um, just some general tips and reminders. Uh, thank you guys for coming in tonight. Um, we're getting very close to the end of the presentation. I appreciate you guys being here. Um, just a few more slides and then we'll be good to go. So um, just make sure you're applying as soon as these applications become available. Typically it is October 1st, but like I said, with all the changes that they did to it, is it is going to be December first um, this year. So make sure you're getting it done as soon as possible after December 1st. Um, they're completely free. Like I said, don't pay anybody to help you fill them out or what have you. Um, keep track of deadlines. There's not a deadline on the FAFSA per se, but there is uh, deadlines on scholarships, on college applications. Um, you know, if you're not keeping track of these deadlines, it's going to be um, missing out on big opportunities for yourself. Just make sure you're getting that stuff done. Um, I have a handout for this over here. Please feel free to grab them. Um, I, I do have more if that's not enough. Um, but it just details ISAC student portal. There's a ton of fun stuff on there. So make sure you're um, taking one of those. These are the websites where you're going to be accessing all this stuff. So um, studentportal.isac.org. Um, we have studentaid.gov and fafsa.gov. That's where you're going to be filling out the FAFSA. Um, it kind of takes you to the same place, basically. And then this bottom one here is for the alternative app. And then lastly, we have um, ISAC's First Gen Scholars Network. I have a handout for this as well. If you are a first gen student, which means that you are the first person in your family to receive a college degree, or your parents did not receive a college degree, then ISAC has a um, First Gen Scholars Network available. Um, you can scan this QR code right now if you want, or it's on the handout over there. If you just fill in a little bit of information, and then um, you'll have access to a lot of uh, great resources and assistance as you make your way to and through the college going process. So if you are a first gen student, make sure you're taking advantage of that. And that's it. That's all I have for you guys. This is my name, my email, my phone number. Um, reach out to me if you have questions. Um, and I appreciate you guys being here tonight. So thank you very much.